Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by the Trek. Today is January 29th, National Puzzle Day. I love puzzles. I was going to assume that you liked puzzles. What about me says loves puzzles? Uh, you like to sit in your house and work on projects for long periods of time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I am your co-host, Zach Patrick Davis, and sitting to my right is... I am Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chaunce. Before we get to today's in-studio guest, got a few reminders for you, as we usually do. Uh, just a reminder that we will soon be auctioning off our amazing Tyvek wall behind our guest here. Everyone that's been in our studio since we've been in Golden has put ink to this Tyvek. Some of the biggest names in walking, uh, that includes Pony... We were hiking Viking, got Not a couple lying. of Skirkas, Abstract. I hate hiking. Yeah. It, everybody who's been anybody on this podcast has signed that and uh, a few people have donated some hair as well which i'm not a big fan of but uh, maybe if you're into hair then you'll pay extra for it yeah but we will be auctioning this off i think through ebay 100 percent of the money that comes in through that will go directly to a nonprofit. currently in the process of deciding which nonprofit that'll be we'll have more details i hope for the next episode but yeah if you want to throw your hat in the ring to have a piece of backpacker radio history on your wall Definitely subscribe or not subscribe. Uh, yeah, subs not subscribe. What's the terminology? Sign up for the Trex newsletter, which is where the information. It's it's been a long week, guys. Don't hold me against this. Uh, Don't hold this against me. Yeah, that too. <laughs> well, this will be a struggle. I've got more alcohol coming. Don't worry. Uh, subscribe. I'm doing it again. Follow us on everything. Fo at the follow us on social and yeah, <laughs> sign up for the Trex newsletter. That's the word we're going for. Uh, speaking of subscribe, I'm getting my wires crossed. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Yes. We're putting out all of these in-studio guest interviews on our YouTube channel. We have a nice fancy Pacific Northwest clouded forest behind us making the aesthetic much nicer than it used to be with just taped up maps and mishmash happenings and you'll get the most content of the contents on youtube um because when sarah's making us these reels that we're sharing on social and on tiktok and on instagram and all those places uh we can only do so much uh without absolutely spamming your feeds but everything that we have from those episodes goes on to youtube whether or not they make the instagram um, TikTok cut. So if you go and you subscribe to the YouTube, you will not miss any of the fun creative clips that we're putting out as shorts on top of the full length interviews. And last but not least, if you are taking on a long distance trek in 2024 and you'd like your journey featured on a large, thriving, amazing platform, consider being a blogger for the trek. We are still accepting applications again for the 2024 season. The link for that will be in the show notes. Okay, no more beating around the bush. Let's get to today's interview. This will be a new one. We love new ones, novel t topics. It is none other than David Moondog Roop, who has done the Natchez Trace Trail, the Florida Trail, and nearly 500 miles through New Mexico. But rather than hiking these miles, he's done much of them on a skateboard. Moondog and his friend Justin Bright became the first people to through skate a national scenic trail this year when they completed the Natchez Trace Trail. Moondog, thank you so much for joining us here on Backpacker Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. First thing is first, tell me a little bit about uh, Madrid, New Mexico. Yeah, so uh, the place that I live now, uh, Madrid, uh, uh, happened uh, because I, we ended up skating uh, through the town. And um, we were actually were just stopped there to get some water and we're going to keep going. And we met somebody and she convinced us to spend the night. And uh, she's like, you have to stay at night. It's Wednesday night. Um, it's uh, hip hop night. And I was like, you guys have a hip hop night. <laughs> and uh, it, so we ended up going. There was like 12 people there. And uh, it ended up being like one of the best concerts I've ever been to. It was just like so much fun. And uh, that night I was like, I think I'm going to move here and uh, just went back to visit after we got done skating and spent a week there and uh, just absolutely loved it and uh, went back to Colorado for about three months and then came and moved to New Mexico. You mentioned that most people in the town live off the grid. They do. Yeah. Are you off the grid as well? I am. So I live in a van and so um, it's like the perfect place for uh, living in a van out there. Like everybody's like accustomed to it. Um, you know, we all do town runs. So like everybody will go to town like once a week kind of thing, get supplies and water and everybody trucks in their own water. So like we're, you're, it's kind of built for living in a van out there. Huh. Is this like a commune? No, that I wouldn't say like it, we're a commune at all. No. <laughs> and everyone makes a town run every week. Are you guys carpooling? Like, do you guys 
coordinate when you're going some people do yeah but most people do it independently yeah and what is the town that you're going into uh santa fe got it how far is the drive is that uh, it's about 30 35 minutes yeah. how would you describe the other people that live in the town so most of the people are artists this is actually what kind of attracted me to this town most of these people are just unique artists uh just different people like nobody in that town is the same kind of person um and everybody just has like this unique thing about them and so there's like 350 people that live there but there's 350 individual people Hmm. And um, everybody just kind of knows each other, and um, but like kind of in my eyes, kind of a positive way, uh, just because we have this strong sense of community. Um, but you know, you're you also know everything about each other. So. That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> what exists in the town? Is it um, just a row of vans, or are there no? Is so there a school? We have. Uh, there used to be a school, but now all the kids go to Santa Fe. But we have uh, like two restaurants. Uh, one of the restaurants is like the uh, main bar, and uh, so everybody kind of meets there at night and hangs out. And um, it's where we do all of our like big parties and karaoke, and that's just where everybody hangs out. Damn, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It sounds fun. It's kind of nice when it's, you have only one, and it's like it's the proper setup for one. Yeah, like it's super nice. And um, so whenever uh, we're hanging out in there, like it feels like you're having just kind of like a classic desert moment. Mm. Yeah, it's a much more like tribal way of going about living. Like you know all of your neighbors, everyone's friendly. That's, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's a good way to live. Yeah. Like, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I also want to know how did you get the trail name Moon Dog? Is that um, a trail name? It is a trail name. Okay. Um, so. It, it actually was chosen for me to keep me from getting a very bad uh, other trail name. What was the very bad other Skater trail Boy. name? Skater <laughs> Boy. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been awful. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Avril Lavigne song? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I've made the joke many times that uh, it would have been better just to have called me Avril Lavigne. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I would have chosen that. Yeah. Over, um, but a, a buddy was like, "You have to change it uh, to something, or you're gonna get stuck with this bad one." And uh, his uh, fiance, now wife, um, it was her birthday, and so uh, she uh, said that the only thing that she really wanted for her birthday was to be able to uh, choose my trail name, and so it felt a bit risky. But uh, I let her, and so she chose Moondog. How do you yeah. just come up with Moondog? Like, does it mean anything? Um, well, like, we were spitballing ideas, and a ex-girlfriend of mine used to call me Moondog, and I always thought that was uh, a good name, and it was just kind of funny. And um, She just pulled that out of thin air? Is there a story? Uh, there, there's a movie called The Beach Bum, and uh, there's just kind of like a uh, charismatic drunk <laughs> character. Um and uh, she just thought I, that I was kind of like him, and so she would call me that kind of in jest. Hmm. Moondog sounds like a skateboarder's name. Yeah, if it's quite well, I guess. Yeah, like yeah. that or a surfer, I could see being called Moondog. Does he remind you of Princess Peach? A little bit. Yeah. M- more I'm so. not familiar. What is Princess Peach? Oh, sorry. Uh, Princess Peach is a hiker in the area that we know. Oh. Very similar cadence and mannerisms. Oh, really? It's a compliment. We love that guy. Okay. Um, so I'm very curious about through skating as a concept. How does this work? Are, when you're doing a trail, are you skateboarding the entire thing? Is it a combination of backpacking and skating? What sorts of terrain are you skating on? Give us the full rundown. So uh, like on the Florida Trail, I did more hiking on that than I did skating. So there's only like 300 plus miles of road on that and so i would i carried like a just a regular skateboard deck so it was lighter and uh and was really just skating on flat roads and the skating was quite nice whenever i could do it and um sometimes i was in towns and stuff like that like when you're in a town and you may not have the best concrete or uh too much traffic uh you'll just pick your board up and walk and just you know just like walking in town hmm do you just use like a standard skateboard or do you also bring or swap out for like a mountain board? I do a longboard uh, as well. And so that's what I've been skating on lately uh, just because it's set up that you can um, basically go further. Like it's more efficient in how it runs. 
and uh, so you can go further without expelling as much energy and uh, it's it's built a bit wider and longer as well uh, so that it'll just go in a straight line hmm. and you're not uh, burning through energy trying to kick through that you said mountain board I've never with a mountain board it's got these yeah. like big fat wheels we used to have it at summer camp um, yeah. but it basically you go down like dirt mountain on mm. it um, but it's got these big fat wheels it kind of feels your feet go into these straps and you could strap them in so it's a little bit like snowboarding mm. but on bigger like dirt road wheels kind of uh, like, like think like about how a jeep would have. yeah yeah i'm picturing going down a mountain with my feet strapped to a board <laughs> sounds like i'm dying <laughs> they've also it. got ones that have like a handbrake so uh, you can take one that has a handbrake and you can slow yourself down with it control your speed a little more huh. there was a kid in high school that uh, uh was uh on one and you strap your feet in on those and he was holding on to a ski rope from the back of a car, and uh, and he fell. And he didn't let go, and oh, man, shit. he got roughed up. And uh, was yeah. this in Florida? This feels like a Florida thing. No, this was a Tennessee thing. <laughs> okay, there's nothing to do. Closer so to Florida than up. we are here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find you a photo of it, um, but we can keep talking while I do. Before we move on, I'm curious. I want to know some skateboard culture thing. Like, are you big in like the professional skateboarding scene? Like, Not really. No. Um, no. I just uh, whenever I got into it, it was just to do it uh, to get into skating was just so that I could uh, kind of hike with a skateboard. Okay. And um, so I really like the uh, tricks and things like that. I didn't really care for all that much. So you're not ollieing and I, I Not can, really. I don't have that, any good skill set at all in that <laughs> regard. <laughs> that's actually kind of fascinating. I would have assumed somebody that has so many miles on a skateboard is like doing half pipes and stuff like that. No, not really. <laughs> yeah. Have you been in a half pipe before? Um, no. Huh. Okay. Well, On rollerblades, yeah. but I know it's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> That's a mountain board. Oh, interesting. Okay. Show the uh, camera so people will subscribe uh, on YouTube. It's not me on the photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you got into this specifically to allow yourself to travel faster on the road sections during hikes? Yeah. Well, actually, I originally got into skateboarding uh, because a buddy of mine was having a kid and I knew he was going to teach the kid how to skateboard. And so I was like, Oh, this would be nice. Something we could do together. And then there was like, became a point where I was like, Oh, I could actually start hiking with a skateboard. Hmm. Yeah. And what do you do with the board when you're hiking? Do you put it between the, the pack and your back? Are you carrying it under your arm? What's like the, most uh, it depends way? on which board I have. So like the lighter skateboard, uh, like regular skateboard deck, uh, I get strapped to the pack. Uh, the longboard I have to carry, uh, that thing ends up being a little bit over nine pounds, I think. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Are you using one trekking pole in the other hand or how are you managing that? I have done that. I did that on the Florida trail, um, just because your legs get more tired, yeah. uh, when you're kicking on that, uh, kind of small deck. Um, and so, uh, I w had like a little rubber tip on the end of it. Uh, that was like a little ball shape and you just kind of push with it. Huh. I was just like about to gondola. ask if you use it as like ski yeah. poles. I'd put on some music and just, you know, <laughs> uh, have at it. And it was a pretty good time. So let's say you're just on roads. How many miles can you usually skate in a day? Um, on the Natchez, we ended up averaging about 40 a day. Oh, wow. And so um, like doing 20, uh, 30 is really quite easy. 40, like uh, you're going pretty consistent, but it's uh, pretty easy. And then you could do like 50, 60 uh, if you're like really kind of like with hiking, if you're really concentrating on it all day. So you didn't grow up skateboarding? No, I didn't start till I was 33. And had you done a lot of backpacking prior to the point that you got into skating? Yeah, I've been backpacking uh, probably uh, since I was like seven, eight, whenever you could join Cub Scouts. Sure. Yeah. So what is your backpacking experience prior to you ever getting on a skateboard? Like, it, did you have any through hikes under your belt prior to that? Uh, no, I hadn't actually. Um, I mostly like uh, climbing or not climbing, hiking here in Colorado. Uh, I hiked a lot in North Carolina, and uh, whenever I lived in Tennessee, I did a lot of the a lot of the AT. Hmm. Is that what is that what put long trails on your map? Is oh, definitely, stuff? yeah. Um, being that close to the AT, like you always hear about it, and you always hear the stories. I always thought it would be, would be neat to do something like that. And then just uh, just started doing it with the skateboard. 
but it was like the luxury item, I guess. Yeah. How did you pick the first trail? Uh, somebody had already done the Florida trail on a skateboard and that's how I had heard about through skating. And, uh, so I was like, well, I want to replicate that because, uh, of the way that he wrote about it. Um, it, it's just, uh, you get to do a, like quite a lot of hiking, uh, but also qu- a good amount of skating. Hmm. It's like the perfect balance of it. What muscles get sore after a full day of skating? I imagine it's a lot of calf extensions. Yeah. Uh, calf, generally the bottom of my foot starts to, uh, the tendon on the bottom starts to get a little tense. Yeah. Um, it, but yeah, it feels, you know, very much kind of like, uh, at the end of through hiking, like your legs are just kind of rubbery and sore and you just kind of try to block it out. Yeah. yeah. So if you got your hiker fitness and let's say like you got to the point where, you know, you're not sore after a long day of hiking, if you were to just get on a skateboard and do a full day of skating, would you be sore after that? Or are the muscles used pretty different? It'd probably depend on the mileage, uh, because in order to do the mileage, you have to up your pace. And so you're kicking, uh, further or more consistently with more force. And, uh, so your legs will get more tired if you're trying to, you do like 50, 60 miles. Hmm. Um, but if I had to do like 40, I probably wouldn't get that tired. Hmm. So is there a strategy besides just like it being kind of fun to using the trekking poles to propel yourself because you're saving that like muscle? Uh, a little bit of strategy, yeah. Huh. And so, and yeah, it gives you a, a little bit of time to reset and just kind of uh, push yourself a little bit further. Are you looking for the lightest longboard? Like, are you factoring in the weight of the board? I imagine you're carrying it so often that that has to play. A factor. Yeah, I'm actually uh, getting ready to set up a carbon fiber board, and uh, so. Uh, that thing is drastically lighter. Um, but even if the board is lighter, like my wheels are still going to be heavy. My trucks are still going to be heavy. So it's, uh, there's only so much I can do, Hmm. but I can cut off, you know, probably a pound or two. I was going to say, does being light, like, does the board itself being lighter affect the difficulty of staying on it and balancing on it? Um, it does, but not to like a huge degree. Um, generally like, especially with, uh, the way that Justin and I skate, like you can only go so fast because, uh, you're basically wearing hiking clothes, right? If you fell with a, especially with your pack on, like it's over. And so, uh, and so we generally go, uh, or try to stay under a certain speed. And what speed is that? Uh, generally like we try not to get really over 12 miles an hour. Um, but you know, if we're on a good downhill, like we'll go 20 uh, plus. Hmm. But we we also have to really assess the risk while we're doing it. Yeah. Are you wearing a helmet? I do, yeah. You do? Okay. Yeah. Going 20 mile an hour on a skateboard with a pack <laughs> feels dangerous to me. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a bit of delusion in it. Yeah. Like, I think we're like, I oh, would be fine. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, I felt like uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and I, I was going maybe like 12 in the rain, and it just like obliterated me. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, this would have been awful at 20. Like, <laughs> How steep was your learning curve? Because uh, I don't know how many people listening to this have actually tried to skateboard before, <laughs> but I have. Yeah. And it's hilariously difficult. Like, I can snowboard just fine, but for whatever reason, that didn't translate to being on a skateboard at all for me. And, yeah, I just spent the entire time eating shit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, eating shit uh, is like 90% of skateboarding, I think. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, they actually, like, if I went back and looked at how I was skating at the beginning of the Florida Trail, I think it would look kind of foolish. Uh, like, I'd be, probably be wobbling all over the place, and uh, it probably wasn't that great. But definitely uh, have a much better skill set now. How many weeks or months of experience did you have prior to the Florida Trail? Um, I think I had about two years of experience, and uh, or a little bit under. Okay. And then, uh, and uh, but nothing really like I hadn't really practiced just doing distance stuff. I had just practiced, you know, staying on the board and all the mobility things. Yeah. And um, yeah. I have a question about the logistics of through skating. Do you need do you need to skate like 51% of the trail for it to be considered a through skate 
or do you just need to have your board with you for the duration of the trail and skate part of it? Like, what is the logistics? I've thought a, lo- a lot about that. I don't think it really matters, though, because, like, I think that um, if you do it from end to end, like, even if you're on a road that um, that you can't skate at all, like, you're still carrying that nine-pound board. And so you're st- it's still making it difficult, and that's, like, the experience of through skating. But I, I do think almost, if you had to put a number to it, it should be 51. Should be. Right? <laughs> and ha- so how long is the Notches Trace Trail? Uh, 444 road? miles. And do you know how many miles of that is road? It's all road. All of it? Yeah. 100% of it? Yeah, it's, it's basically like a parkway. Oh. I want to get a Razor scooter and scooter this thing. Yeah. This that, I think that would be very possible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be too. I can't skateboard. I'm like Zach. I, but uh, you could z- definitely scooter. Yeah, you could I could get scooter. you like a little trailer behind it. Oh, and I could like pull the, yeah, this is making ideas happen. If we get enough video? Patreon supporters, maybe we'll attempt a through skate of the Nachos Trail. <laughs> I would either through Razor scooter it or I would through rollerblade it. Both of which yeah. I am open to. What about roller skate? Um, No, I don't like roller skates as much. Okay. I would need to practice braking on rollerblades. Yeah. Because I can go. Yeah. I just can't n- stop. Do you ever contemplate sending your board ahead for the long hiking stretches? Um, I had a few times, but I like the idea that you keep all of your gear with you the whole time. Mm-hmm. And so I just keep it with me just out of some weird feeling of guilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> it's it's an interesting hack because everybody that we talk to that's hiked the Florida Trail says, I love it. Well, not everyone, but most people say they love it, but the roadwalks are insane. And if you can find a way to make the roadwalks, one, faster, but two, fun, uh, you've really complemented the journey quite nicely. Do you end up looking forward to the road sections more than the trail sections? I think it depends on how tired I am in any given section. So like if I'm just kind of sick of hiking that day, whenever I get to the road, I'm super excited. Mm-hmm. But if I've been skating all day, I'll like want to do a bit more hiking. So I'm excited when I get back to the trail. Hmm. All right. We need some good shit eating stories. Yeah. Like one. Tell actually, us about all the shit. I have eat. a really good one on the Florida trail. Um, and granted, I believe that this woman probably had some, problems that uh going on with her um but i was skating on a sidewalk and uh there was a woman just sitting in the grass right here and uh i ended up hitting a crack that i don't see it just went down immediately like no time to save it and uh ended up so generally whenever i fall i try to like curl one way or the other and um so as i was falling i didn't get my hand underneath and I ended up just scraping the heck out of my hand. Hmm. And, um, and I, but I did it right in front of this woman and I rolled over. I was like, Holy cow. I was like, did you see that? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and she was like, yeah. And then she, so the only thing that she, she ended up saying was, yeah. And then she just immediately started talking about one of her personal problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sucks I to be you. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm literally like squirting blood and it's like, <laughs> it's coming out so fast. And uh, she just kept going on about something that was going on with her. What, it, what was her complaint? Uh, I really can't remember, but you know, <laughs> you to me, it didn't seem thing. that big of a deal. Yeah, right. <laughs> Probably took. Well, I wonder if there's a strategy there to kind of take your mind off the paint and like, hey, no, let, I, <laughs> let me say something completely yeah. out there. Yeah, she wasn't completely bleeding out at that time. Yeah, maybe she was. Uh, That's funny. Okay, right, when else have you eaten shit? Um, I did it. I just got done skating in Puerto Rico. And there was a hill that I was, it was raining and I was like, this, like, you're definitely going too fast. And, uh, there was a, uh, I really don't know what they're called, but those businesses that sell, uh, different types of gravel, dirt and things like that. Uh, uh, they had a, like a little factory there on the, uh, on the left and all of the soot that had come off the trucks, uh, Mm -hmm. was like at the waiting at the bottom of this hill and like the second i hit it i was like oh yeah we're going down and i just smacked i had no time to save it and i was like wearing my rain jacket now it's shredded and uh yeah and so uh i it definitely learned my lesson i was like when as i was going down i was like this is too fast yeah do you does it make you ever take considerations for what you're wearing because like i feel like i would want 
to have long layers on the rain jacket was probably great for stopping you from getting like rug burn or road yeah. burn or whatever you call it um does it impact what you wear when you're doing these trips not really actually um i tried skating uh where i live in new mexico there's a great uh just a long stretch of road and so i went out one day in like kevlar pants in like a motorcycle uh jacket like the the real really breathable type and i was like let me just try to skate in this and i did like something small like six or eight miles and i was like i'm gonna die yeah. <laughs> sounds hot yeah so i put it all in a backpack uh and whenever i was going home huh. <laughs> So compare and contrast the Florida Trail and the Natchez Trace Trail because one was a true through skate, right? From one end to the next, you're on the skateboard. And the other one's a mix of uh, backpacking and skating. Do you have a preference in terms of style of adventure between the two? Um, I don't think I have a particular style. I think I like them kind of in the middle because like, I uh, I did the Florida Trail with more of the hiking with the the board, uh, and then everything I've done since then has been uh, more on the roads. And so now I'm like kind of itching to go back to the hiking with the lighter skateboard. Hmm. And so I think it's just like whichever one I've kind of done more of, I'll kind of start leaning the other way. How many trails? kind of meet the same criteria as the Florida Trail? Because if you were to describe to me what makeup is best for something that you're describing, the Florida Trail would probably be the top of my list. Uh, yeah, it's got to be the top. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm having trouble thinking of too many other trails with such significant road miles and one that's not like so incredibly vertical. Like, So there's road miles on the CDT, but that's more gravel road and you'd be carrying a skateboard hellacious miles up and down mountains yeah uh i'm trying to think like what is even on your bucket list at this point um i think that the mountain to sea trail in north carolina i think that that one could be skated um the, i think clothing would be actually be the thing you'd have to figure out um because i don't think that like because you're uh skating in the mountains and with tight corners and things like that so you got to do something better than hiking clothes and so I think that would be one where possibly like changing clothes, like wearing uh, climbing pants or something like that. Yeah. Mm. Are you able to skate up the mountain or do you just carry the skateboard? How uh, it depends work? how steep it is. Okay. Um, if it's uh, like just gradual, uh, we'll, uh, we will skate up it uh, with the idea being that like you're still going slightly faster than if you were walking uh -huh. and you're not burning so much, uh, burning that much more energy. And so, um, we, but if it's like steeper, we'll just pick it up and walk. Yeah, it's burning more energy. Are you sweating harder when you're skating up a slight incline versus walking it? Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's, especially in Puerto Rico, like when I would skate up to the top of something, my shirt would just be completely drenched. Mm. I, I, for me, I feel like that would hurt my legs more. Like knees down, if you're pushing yourself up that way, does it just um, kill? It depends how steep it is. Like if it's just a slight incline, like you really don't feel it all that terribly much, uh, much more. And so, um, yeah, you're just kind of kicking, uh, kicking upward. And uh, I don't really know how to explain it that well, but you're kind of kicking with more force going forward. And uh, sorry, I don't feel like I'm explaining it no, that well. that makes well. sense. Yeah. Are you using the same kick foot throughout the journey or do you switch back and forth to relieve uh, yourself? So I kick with only my right foot and Justin kicks with both. Are your calves asymmetrical in terms of how big they are? Uh, my ankles are. Yeah? Yeah. Can we see them? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it may Another plug for the YouTube here. Right now. I haven't been putting on significant miles. They actually oh, I can see deep. the right one is definitely bigger. Yeah. yeah. Lift them up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll move them over. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. So your buddy switches back and forth? He does, yeah. Justin, you said? Does he go 50-50, or is it just like when one gets tired? Uh, probably like 70-30. Okay. And uh, he does it more leisurely when he's kicking on his left. Uh -huh. um, and then he, whenever he uh, switches to his right, he tries to use more force. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you tried 
Is it referred to as goofy footed when you switch? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I wasn't oh. sure if it was the same as snowboard terminology. Have you tried going goofy foot? I have. I'm just kind of wobbly with it, and uh, I it, honestly, if I practice just a little, uh, I'd be able to do it much better. Yeah. But um, I, I'm just kind of wobbly. Whenever you're like skating in cars, I, I don't always like. I want to have as much control as I can. Hmm. So the Florida Trail was your first long trail, right? Uh, Florida Trail. Mm -hmm. Yes. How was that going from the backpacking experience you have with the Cub Scouts and doing bits on the AT? How was it actually doing a full trail start to finish? How was, sorry, say that one more time. Just like how was the experience of doing a full trail from start to finish? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Um, it actually, I feel like changed uh, me quite philosophically about how I saw life and how I saw like uh, work-life balance. And so I kind of realized on the Florida Trail, I was like, you, you know, even though I was living in a van, I was like, you'd be fine living in a tent uh, full time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it just kind of showed me that I could be more of a dirtbag than I thought. Was there a moment that you had this realization or did it come just like throughout? Um, yeah, I feel like it was like two weeks in where I was like, oh, you like feel fit right at home with this. Did you encounter other Florida Trail through hikers during this? I did, yeah. So there's actually not a lot of uh, Florida Trail through hikers, and I actually went southbound, and so there's like nobody going southbound, and uh, but you do actually get to see the northbounders, and so intersect a bit. And actually, a lot of the people that I met on that trail uh, we're like still friends today, hmm. and we uh, we have like group chat and we talk at it almost every single day. Did you see any alligators? I oh, see tons of them, hundreds, I, yeah. Like hundreds. Yeah. Close up not like probably the closest i ever got was like from here um uh, here to the end of the room but like they're so sedentary like at first like whenever i first went to florida i was actually quite scared of alligators and then after you see like 50 of them and they're just laying there and they never move you start to kind of get desensitized to them yeah until it, one of them's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. they can move pretty fast. I've seen videos. Yeah, but in the wintertime, they are trying to conserve their energy. So, like, they're going to have to think it's a sure thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what was the biggest snake that you saw? Um, actually, it was like a diamondback rattlesnake. And um, that thing was humongous. Yeah. And it lunged at me, actually. And um, it Are you walking or riding at this point? Uh, I was walking. Uh, it was in a, a place called St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. And so they take it very seriously. So, like, if you're on that land, like, you can't kill any animals. You can't do anything. And um, so this thing just coiled up and started rattling at me. And uh, I started backing up, and it lunged at me. <laughs> and uh, so I just backed up about, you know, 10, 15 feet. And I was like, it'll move along. And that thing didn't go anywhere. Huh. And uh, so uh, after about five minutes, I ended up just kind of rerouting around him. It must be nice yeah. to have a skateboard on hand, though, because I feel like that makes a good shield, too. You know, I was thinking about that. Like, I was like, you could probably uh, probably get him. And then I was like, no, you could. And like, <laughs> I'd be swinging it and it would just latch on, you know? <laughs> Do you ever have gear malfunctions with the skateboard itself? Like, do wheels get chipped or anything that requires maintenance along the journey? Not really. All of our gear is built, like, to last extremely long miles. Um, like, the board that I ride on has, like, 2,500 miles on it. And um, and they just build it to last forever. And, uh, and so you really don't have to worry about your gear that much. Uh, we'll bring, like, an extra bearing with us. Uh, but for the most part, you never have problems. Are there companies that make skateboards and longboards specifically for this sort of thing? Or is it just that companies that make skateboards expect them to get beaten up? Um, it's actually a little bit of both, but uh, mainly, mainly there are companies that make longboards for long distance. Um, but also just all skateboard companies know their boards are going to get beat up. So is there like a community around long distance longboarding? Uh, there is, yeah. A lot of the that community is kind of uh, based around uh, like time trials and things like that. Um, and so like they're trying to set speed records. And so a lot of the focus of that community is more kind of on the uh, track side of it more so than the like adventure side of it. What are the what are the typical long distance runs that people are usually trying to set these FKTs on? Uh, so what they do is what's called an ultra skate. 
And so it's as much as you can skate for 24 hours uh, done on a track. And so it's oh. done in, uh, there's a few different places they do it, but here in the U.S. it's done Homestead, Florida. And uh, so they rent out a NASCAR track for 24 hours and uh, just, yeah, go around it the whole thing. Are they doing it like NASCAR where if you have to like pee or something, you're going over to the pit stop and just running? Yeah, no, you're on the board. Most people You're peeing will, while boarding? A lot of people will pee while they're on the board. So you have the option, obviously, to stop, but uh, a lot of people will pee on the board. Is it going down their leg or are they just whipping their thingy out? And yeah, you just whip it out and, wow. uh, you know, just give a little lean. What is it like <laughs> peeing at such a fast speed? Uh, well, generally you're not going that fast. Uh, you, you try to go like a, a maintainable amount, but you also don't want to stop because then you're going to be wiggling all over the place. Mm-hmm. And uh, so yeah, you just go maybe five, six miles an hour. But also, I you know, if you're on a good downhill, why not? Probably pretty freeing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Just make sure you're facing backward. Yeah. What if you're behind someone who's doing that? Yeah. You're just getting <laughs> rained on. <laughs> not a good. It's a good way shower. to slow down your opponent. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a goat of through skating or whatever the ultra skating rather? Uh, I would say this guy, Paul Kent, uh, he's out of Canada and uh, he was uh, like making videos of him doing it. I think like uh, in the early 2000s, maybe even the 90s, he may be insulted by that. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, he was like going out with his buddies and they were going all over the world and skating and uh, and he was kind of like the OG of it. Is there any, like, interesting shit that skaters do that hikers don't that we would be surprised to hear about? Oh, I hate to disappoint you. I don't think there's really any huge difference, uh, especially at through skating. I think, like, uh, uh, whenever it comes to hiking and through skating, like, a lot of the skill sets just transfer uh, very easily. I don't know if there are any, like, fun things the community does or... Yeah, actually... um, there is a thing where like if you're doing a race um uh, the people that place have to drink beer out of their shoe ah. and there's Shoeies. a name for is it what's it called shoey shoey yeah. those are becoming yeah. popular a recurring in subject too. on this podcast yeah, yeah. yeah. so you, i'm glad i'm not a part of that you have never done a shoey <laughs> i haven't no me neither i'm trying huh? to keep that consistent as long as i can yeah, yeah. Speak- I feel like that would be one of those things where, like, you'd get sick and your doctor would be like, why would you do this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of shoeys, is there specific footwear that's ideal for a skateboard? Or are you just using ultras or what? Yeah, I, I skate in ultra low peaks. And, um, so yeah, it works great for just switching uh, because your foot actually splains out when you're skating the same that it does when you're hiking. And so uh, the uh, open toe box, the wide toe box, uh, works great for whenever your foot's doing that skating as well. What's um, what's some skating lingo that would be used in a sk- through skate? Like, let's say I'm through skating. What kind of terms or phrases would I use to describe encounters I may have? Like, the only ones that I can think of are like the ones they. Uh, the quintessential ones where I think people use more flowery language while they're skating than the way they would like if they're hiking. And so people are more likely to say something like far out or something like that. Mm. So there's no like shred and gnar, like there's not the ski culture. You know, I don't think I'm the guy that's in the middle of that. Okay. You know? <laughs> uh, tell us about this New Mexico through skate. Yes. This, oh, actually, this is where your love for Madrid came, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so while I was, or whenever I got done skating uh, in Florida, uh, somebody reached out to Justin and I and was like, because uh, we didn't know each other, and they were like, hey, you guys should uh, really know each other and uh, try to meet up if you could. And so we ended up meeting up a few weeks later at a hiker meetup. And uh, just the second we met, we just kind of became best friends and um we're the just, two people on earth doing this thing <laughs> right yeah <laughs> we should hang out <laughs> yeah we just but even like philosophically like on life and things like that we just saw eye to eye and the way that we like to uh kind of be dirt bags together and things like that um we really aligned quite well is he also living in madrid no um he would probably be miserable he's uh probably he's 25 26 years old and uh you know trying to date and things like that in a small town of 350 the tinder scene isn't thriving in yeah, yeah. 350 <laughs> yeah yeah and we're desert people sure you know yeah, we, yeah. we don't look great <laughs> <laughs> nice tans though right yeah great tans yeah 
um, so sorry, I think I cut you off. Uh, give us the rundown on the New Mexico through skate. Okay, but yeah, so uh, Justin and I ended up meeting, and uh, we um, were sent by a fire one night, and we were like, oh, we should skate together. And somehow we just uh, came up with New Mexico, and uh, maybe like four weeks later, uh, we ended up meeting in New Mexico and really didn't know each other that much and started skating together and had a kind of a rough idea of where we were going to go. And we just kind of planned about two or three days ahead of us. It's, that's got to be a strange thing, right? To set off on a long journey like that with somebody that you hardly know in the, like this incredibly niche activity. Like, oh, yeah. did it feel like the first day of school or how do you relate the feeling of starting that with somebody that like, you well, really know? Justin and I uh, have very similar senses of humor, humor. And uh, so like just instantly we could make each other laugh. And I think that that went a long way, like in the first bit of it, because we were just kind of laughing at the same things. And so we just kind of hit it off instantly. Hmm. How are you deciding where to go? Like, how's that conversation happening between you guys? Uh, kind of based uh, upon like, uh, number one, like how much traffic is on the road, but also like, what does our supplies look like? Like where can we get water, food, uh, thing, um, you know, uh, different supplies like you would on a through hike. And so we have a little bit more ability to decide that than you would if you're hiking, because we can kind of go in different directions. And this one was a certified through skate, like you're on the skateboard the entire route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no there hiking. is walking, but like it, it's, you know, we're well over that 51%. Okay. Yeah. If you had to estimate for this particular adventure, what percentage of the thing is skating versus hiking? Uh, probably 70. Okay. Um, sometimes you just get tired and then sometimes you get burnt out on skating. You just want to pick it up and walk. Yeah. yeah. When you're through skating with someone, are you always like within eyesight of each other or is it like through hiking where you might be like, okay, let's meet here for lunch. Here's where we're going for end of day. And then you don't see him again till then. Uh, we kind of do a bit of both where, um, uh, like there'll be days where we skate together the whole day. There's times where we do about 50, 50. And uh, he's faster than I am, so uh, he's always ahead, and uh, so I'm always just kind of catching up to him. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, we just kind of communicate about what we want. So I'm basically the AT and the PCT are the only trails where you can reliably go into town and tell somebody that you're through hiking and they know what you're talking about, right. or like they know that long distance backpacking is even a thing. When you're telling people about what you're doing, you're through skating, like. I hardly am grasping with this. <laughs> so like you meet somebody in one of these small towns, you tell right. them that you're skating across their state. What's the reaction that you get? Generally we get something with an accent where they're like, you're skating on that whole thing. And like, uh, and we get, yeah, it basically is that statement regurgitated in different ways. Hmm. And, um, so we just kind of explain what we're doing and how far we've gone and, um, just try to give them details and people are generally pretty interested. What's uh between any of the three, the Florida Trail, the New Mexico through skate, and the notches? What's one of the standout moments that you've had on one of these trails? Um, I think like uh, probably going through Madrid, but just kind of uh, it was it just kind of felt like a magical moment where uh, Justin and I were just having a great time together. And uh, we discovered this town that kind of seemed like Disney World almost and uh, just kind of partied it up. And uh, but I don't know. It's hard to pick. There's so many great moments. Is there more like party vibes on a through skate because you're going through towns more or you're on roads more? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, like not, I don't drink and he's not a huge drinker, uh, but we do love to like uh, just kind of like party and hang out and so we'll kind of you know gravitate towards what we find interesting when you're planning these routes then are you choosing place like are you trying to route it to go through towns as frequently as possible so that you can get that experience no we'll also uh go out of the way um it really just kind of depends on what we're looking for and kind of what's ahead so if there's uh, if we can go like on a longer road uh with a longer water carry we can uh uh, but we can see something like a better view, then um, we'll pick that way uh, rather than the town. Are you looking at topo maps in addition to the road maps? Because I imagine 
I'm thinking from my perspective, I want the flattest possible route. Though you just mentioned a good view. I imagine maybe the flattest route doesn't always grant you that. But uh, yeah, I, I, just looking at a roadmap, you can't tell how right. high or low something gets. Yeah, we'll I, use uh, both like a Google Maps type setup and Gaia and uh, kind of compare them. Mm. But generally, we'll just kind of look at what the satellite image looks like and try to detect uh, which way it's going to go. And are there any major no-nos in terms of picking the route? Like I imagine no interstate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> are there other things like that? Um, yeah, we basically just tried to avoid like uh, like higher traffic areas. And so uh, like that will push us to the edges of town a lot. And, um, and so we'll try to, you know, uh, figure out like what's going to be more scenic um, and what's going to be like the unique experience, like finding the unique town over like getting there faster. Hmm. Let's talk about the particulars of the Natchez Trace. How did you land on this one? I imagine the fact that this is the only National Scenic Trail that is fully road paved, right? Right. It actually wasn't even on our map, um, but I was talking to a guy uh, that has another podcast, Constantine. Yeah. And uh, after we were doing his podcast, um, we were just talking on the phone, and he's like, you should really look at the doing this trail that I did so I could get my 11. And he's like, uh, it's the Natchez Trace. And so I pulled it up while we were on the phone and just started looking at it. And then after we got off off the call, uh, I texted it to Justin. I was like, hey, take a look at this. And then that night we talked on the phone and just decided to do it. <laughs> like we've been trying to come up with ideas and nothing really felt good. And then uh, the second that we like kind of brought that up, we were like, this is the one. So now he set the precedent that every time you leave a podcast, you're getting yeah. an idea you for give something it, yeah. to do. Yeah. So we're on the hook here, Charlie. So, so true. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll wrap back around to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so give us the walkthrough of this trail uh, from the skater's perspective. So it's called a trail, but it's really a parkway. And it's a 444-mile uh, trail that they were trying to protect the land around. And so they got it called a trail just to protect that land. And... Um, it's actually amazingly nice paved roads. Um, it was so easy. Uh, the skating was phenomenal um, uh, because like uh, the smooth roads, not a lot of traffic. And so the 444 miles just felt like it was just him and I and just a few tourists out there. Hmm. What time of year did you go? Uh, we went in October. Okay. And so. Is it better to do it in the spring or fall? Because I can imagine like being a nice paved road also means not much shade right right yeah so actually originally i was trying to get us to go uh in september and i'm so thankful that he convinced me on october because we would have been so hot even in september yeah yeah um because in october like even when you're skating you're you're getting quite warm and like you know going uh fast will help with the wind speed and thing and um you know keeping you cooler but um but yeah is this one that would be good as a winter option? Because I imagine it sounds kind of like a shoulder season trip, but would there be snow or does it get cold? Like, is this something that would be good for people to do in, say, December or January? Uh, so long as you don't have ice, uh, you could skate on, uh, you know, even when the pavement's wet. But um, once it turns to ice, you can't do it at all. So, but I, I really wouldn't suggest it, actually, in like because of the chance of it you getting an ice – uh, and then just being out there uh, is probably pretty hi highly likely in December, January. Mm -hmm. okay. Have you considered picking up one of these mountain boards and doing something a little bit more rugged? Like we interviewed a guy who did the Colorado Trail on a unicycle. So we, oh, that's we've learned crazy. That, yeah, we've learned that basically anything can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, would you do something like that on a more rugged board? I don't like the idea that you're strapped into it. And so, it's not like fully strapped in like a snowboard. There's just the two foot things that you slide your feet into. Yeah, so but that, if you go down and they don't slide back out. No, they will slide. They oh, will they come will out. Slide? It's more so that like if you go over bumps, like we used it for jumps where mm -hmm. like you have it to hold the top of your foot into, um, but you're definitely not like clipped in. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't consider it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I will. I'll, uh, I'll try it out and then uh, make a decision. I think doing it with a pack would just be difficult. Yeah. I don't know. Something about it just makes me think yeah, I'd definitely get hurt. Yeah. How are you protecting your board when you're in town? Do you just leave it out? 
yeah basically just leave it out yeah um if like if i get some um, uh sand or uh real good grit uh, in the bearings sometimes i'll uh, sometimes i'll take them out and clean them with the windex and then uh i carry grease with me and so uh and so i can always just kind of repair things there mm. how often are you doing maintenance on it not often yeah this stuff is kind of built to last and all of our gear is to go long distance and uh so everything's designed to last quite a while so i just don't even worry about it you mentioned being on a podcast previously one thing that we notice sometimes is that when we stop recording someone will think of something that they're like oh shoot i should have talked about that when we were on it did you have any thoughts when you got off the last podcast where you were like damn i wish i talked about that I could pretend to hit the button that we're stopping recording right now. Okay. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, talking about the gear and like how it crosses over from ultralight. Um, I think that that's something that uh, I haven't talked enough about. Here's yeah. your opportunity. I would imagine that lighter gear is a major asset for something that you're yeah. doing, like a really heavy pack and then going downhill. It seems like it creates more problems than oh, definitely. a lighter yeah. pack. <laughs> So, yeah, I guess um, walk us through your so Yeah, we use a lot of the same philosophies of ultralight, and a lot of our gear, almost all our gear, uh, is uh, the same gear that we use while we're hiking. Um, but we think of the, the gear in the same terms while we're skating, uh, in which gear we pick, uh, even b- the, based on the tools that we need. <clears throat> if you could design your dream board, what would it – like? Are there innovations that need to be made in the through skating culture? You know what? I think it's like as good as it can get. Like, I think we'll only get like incrementally better. Mm -hmm. Um, But the technology we have now is just kind of amazing. Um, It'll probably get lighter. Like they'll figure out a a composition uh, that'll make it overall lighter, uh, but just as strong. And uh, once something like that comes along, it may change things a bit. But I think people kind of like things how they are. Hmm. And what were you doing when you went down to Puerto Rico? Because you mentioned that a couple times, too. Aside from getting food poisoning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that was the highlight of this trip, <laughs> really. <laughs> no, I went down to try to see if it could be skated. And I really didn't uh, tell many people I was doing it because, um, like, I've heard the roads are bad down there. And so I was like, you know, I may try to do like a hundred miles and ship this thing back home. Um, but it ended up being a good time skating. Uh, there were, there was like one day where I had to go through the mountains and had real narrow roads with like every corner was a blind corner. And, uh, so there was like one day of walking that board the whole day. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, but every other day I, I could skate a good portion of the day. Is there no, like, beta on stuff like that yet? Like, is there any forums for skateboarders where they say they've done this? And um, Not really. Actually, I couldn't find any information of anybody skating it before uh, or, like, doing a, a kind of through skating of the perimeter. And um, so I'm not really sure if I'm the first, but there's no, like, great way to check up on that. Then how would you pick Puerto Rico? Um, I was reading a book uh, by Hunter S. Thompson, and he was talking about, uh, it's actually like him writing letters, and uh, he was telling a friend how much he liked Puerto Rico, and they just kind of put it in my head, and then I was reading another book, and they mentioned Puerto Rico, and so I was just like, yeah, let's try it out. So now you've mentioned Hunter Thompson. You also said that you like to party, but you don't like to drink. What is your definition of party? Because I know his definition of party it's, oh, a, it's I, yeah, a pretty wild <laughs> <laughs> version of it. I'm like the uh, the light version for okay. sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what's on your bucket list here moving forward in the next five years? What sorts of through skates are you looking to find yourself? I think it would be good, uh, or it'd be nice to do like a CDT version, and uh, you know, um, almost follow the CDT, but kind of uh, pick maybe even more like scenic uh, routes uh, that you could do by road. And, um, and so I think that would be nice. Uh, I, I've been thinking about doing, uh, something in Chile. Uh, I kind of just like the shape of it and so it it works well for the shape that I need to skate. And, uh, and so, um, to see all the different, uh, cultures down there would be quite nice. Sweet. Do you find people reaching out to you often who want to do this and are like looking for tips yeah it happens pretty frequently um people will uh even 
I get probably like a smaller amount of people that uh, want to know about the skating side of it, uh, but more of like the camping gear side of it, like what kind of tent that I use, um, you know, how do I do food carries and, um, you know, just the basic hiking tips. Do you have any blog or anything like that where you share your intel? Uh, not really. Um, that's something I've been playing around with a little bit. Uh, just kind of talking about not just with through skating, but like how to pack uh, bags better for like adventures. And um, so that you could kind of like go lighter uh, and, you know, not spend as much. Mm. Sweet. I think that exhausts all of my questions. John, do you have anything else? No, I think I'm good yeah what's uh what's for the immediate future what do you think is going to come next for you um my girlfriend lives in tennessee so i'm gonna go there for a couple of weeks are you gonna um, skate there i'm not no <laughs> <laughs> i figured i'd fly um it would take probably take me like a month and a half yeah sure um but uh yeah so i'm gonna fly and spend a few weeks there and then probably go back to new mexico for a little bit Sweet. Nice. Well, where can people fo follow you on Instagram and anything else you want the listeners of Backpacker Radio to yeah, know? Yeah, just about the only thing I have is uh, my Instagram. And so it's Rooptown, R-O-O-P-T-O-W-N. And, uh, yeah, so that's about the only thing I keep up with, and I have to keep up with that. Sweet. Well, Moondog, thanks for sharing your story with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, very excited to introduce this one. This is uh, my favorite content series that we do throughout the year. I've been doing it for many years. This is the first edition I'm gonna belch, of the 2023 AT Through Hiker Survey. This year we broke the general info into two different parts. So this one is still as long as it would normally be, but we go into greater depth meaning you guys get even more AT through hikers survey info juice coming at you. This particular piece covers previous hiking experience. I guess I should introduce it more. So we survey uh, this year, I think we had 409 responses of people who attempted an AT through hike. The vast majo majority of them actually having completed the trail. Um, we do a series of posts. This first one, oh shit, my computer's freezing, uh, covers their demographics, it's easier to do when I actually have my show notes, uh, previous hiking experience, reasons why people finish the trail or don't, their start dates, hikers daily mileage, their budget, and this year the average was about 7,500 and much more. Um, this is a very fascinating piece and every year we have very talented people taking this on. This will be the second year that Kate Richard will be taking this on. And uh, yeah, if you like data, if you like learning about the through hiking culture, if you like learning about the AT, this is definitely a good one to check out. And uh, these, we'll be releasing these on a weekly basis. So part two for the general information will be coming out uh, a week after this one. So look forward to that on a future Trek propaganda. Okay, today's question of the day is, what's the weirdest thing you've brought home on a night out I'm yes. Taking thing in a very, uh, can be any sort of noun. Okay. Person, place, or thing. Interested in where you're going to take this. <laughs> um, oh, person, haha. <laughs> no one notable. Um, okay. My you ever had any like extremely regrettable hookups? I'm not talking about that on the podcast <laughs> that my parents listen to. Um, we could just tell them to not listen. Nah. <laughs> I don't trust them. Okay. Um, what's would... what's the most uh, embarrassing thing that you're willing to admit in this general? Well, th we've got reminder Christmas tree. I'll tell that story. Uh, yeah, that wasn't the direction. Um, I'll tell steer. you. I'll tell you a funny story for that when we're okay. off air. Okay. I've, I've got the go-to. Trying um, to pretend like I hit the off button. <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. Um, okay. So this was a New Year's Eve um, that I spent. I just got a text that says got you rainbow sorbet from in the middle of nowhere sorry that's that's a win that's exciting um <laughs> so focus who sells rainbow sorbet don't know okay that is that has nothing we weren't even having a conversation this yeah. is just out of the blue nice love my boyfriend um okay so there was a new year's eve uh i was at a friend's house the details are fuzzy it was new year's eve yeah um and we walked somewhere. I don't know where we walked. I don't know if we walked to hang out with someone or to go somewhere, but we walked somewhere from their house. Um, 
And the part I remember is that on the walk home, because it's New Year's, like Christmas is coming on, we passed someone's yard who had already discarded of their Christmas tree, like they had brought it to the curb, um, which I thought was a bit early to already have it on the curb. But this was a good looking tree. Yeah. Like this tree was a full bodied big boy. Like this was a great looking tree. Mm -hmm. Um, Some some things get fuzzy. I essentially learned the rest of the story the next morning when I woke up. But I decided it was too good of a tree to just leave there. Um, so I brought it home to my friend's house. You and carried home a full Christmas tree? It wasn't tree? even like her house. It was her parents' house. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I took this tree and I decided this is too good of a tree to leave on the side of the road. And I brought the tree blocks, like blocks we walked home to her house and instead put it on her curb, like right in front of her house. <laughs> I was hoping that you actually brought it into the house because I could only imagine the pine needles that are being shed on December 31st after it's been living in a puddle of water. I for mean, a month. I woke up and I was like, did I do that? And I looked out the window and there's this fucking tree <laughs> in the front yard. I'm like, oh, I did that. Yeah. And I'm not going to own up to it either. Do you recall how far you dragged it? It, it was several, several streets. Okay. Um, I mean, a, a considerable amount being that I was probably scantily dressed and in yeah. heels. Yeah. Um, mine is actually quite easy. This is a very easy question of the day for me because I probably have said this on the podcast before. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, this was maybe mine and Jenna's third date and we went to sexy pizza downtown or like over in the Cap Hill area. And we went there at like 1102. Apparently they closed at 11. The doors weren't locked yet. We walked in. We're like, Hey, we were hungry. We want pizza. We're drunk, obviously. Um, they're like, Sorry, guys, we're closed. We actually just threw out all the pizza. You're shit out of luck. They're like, but if you want it, they said this in jest. It's actually hanging out in the dumpster. <laughs> so we walked down the alley behind Sexy Pizza, head on over to the dumpster just to check out the scene. And uh, yes, the pizza was in the dumpster, but they were still in the boxes there. sitting on top of the rest of the trash. There. <clears throat> uh, some of the boxes weren't closed all the way, but... You know, we're new into the relationship at this point, so we're still trying to preserve some of our identity and seem like we are not raccoons just digging into the trash. So we're both pretending like, yeah, no, we shouldn't. This is dumb. We're not going to eat this. This is trash pizza. We're not eating trash pizza. And then I'm like, unless you want to eat trash (laughs) pizza. Uh, And I grabbed a box. She grabbed a box. And we proceeded to eat a shit ton of trash pizza for the entire, like, mile walk from sexy pizza back to her place. Wow. Did you get some? Yeah. Nice. Now you got some I mean, chance. no. No. We waited until we were married. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna's parents. My parents don't care. But Do the, Does Jenna's parents listen to this? Uh, Probably not. I hope not. God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> God, I hope not. I just feel like I love these stories because Jenna's so put together and like a grown adult. Yeah, but everyone has had their 20s. Yeah. Right? I just like to hear about hers. Yeah. No, she, you know, we like to cut loose. We're old and haggard, so like it's fun to look back on these stories and laugh because now our, our typical Friday night is falling asleep at eight thirty after like chasing children for the full day. So, yeah. uh, how far we've come from eating trash pizza to being like it'll be a miracle, and I'm not exaggerating. She definitely won't be awake past midnight on New Year's Eve. She hasn't done it in seven years, probably. It's been a long time. Well, I feel like if you're not at like a social gathering, what do you have to stay awake for? Because the ball doesn't, I, I've I've griped about this here before. The ball yeah. doesn't drop at midnight here. It drops at 10 p.m. Yeah. I don't even think she can make it to 10, to be honest with you. I She's been awake past 10 o'clock. I'm not exaggerating. Five times this year. Good for her. She sounds well rested. Yeah, I know a, that's not the case, but. Uh, she's, she's an excellent sleeper and she's passed her traits on to uh, one of our three children. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we're old and haggard, and that's the fun things that we used to do. Today's Triple Crown, I'm really excited for this Triple Crown. I am too. <sighs> this could be a reoccurring segment as far I as I'm concerned. I think it needs to be, because okay. I think this is one of, like, there's some that we've done, like the Triple Crown of Hot Takes, where I've just had that as a note in my notepad, and as I've gotten angry, I've written things down. Um, I think this is a good one of that realm. Yeah, kind of the same theme. I'll introduce it. And shout out to Rachel. She originally had the triple crown of heavy machinery. Was this yours or hers? It was definitely mine. Okay. I don't, 
Like I couldn't even name three heavy machinery things I'm <laughs> looking it up. I don't know why I put it. Okay. Uh, this is the triple crown of our presidential campaign promises. Yes. So like if we were in charge of the U.S., these are the things that we are making our top priority items. Yes. Do you want to go first? Um, yes. I'm now tempted to reserve my honorable mentions if we are going to make this a recurring thing. No, we will think of more. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, this is one that you could probably do forever. Um, okay, my first one is baby otters everywhere. Chomps 2024. <laughs> I just think we need more baby otters and we need them everywhere. I can't remember if this happened on the podcast or off, but I got a suggested for you on Facebook and it was a baby otter page mm. and they were posting really cute photos of baby otters. Yeah. So I followed them and now I get like more suggested for yous with more otters and it's just increasing because I'm loving every bit of it. So the algorithm's like working for me and I'm working for it. Yeah. Um, and all it's made me realize is we need more baby otters. I think like petting. I would love to see your Instagram explore page. <laughs> That's like that a, can be a future Patreon. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. what, what could be so embarrassing about that that you wouldn't share? I don't think that there's anything embarrassing. I just don't think there's enough baby otters there. Right. Um, um, okay. <laughs> have you, have you, because you have children, watched the show Nanoland yet? No. It's like that little green like kid with the pigtails, and she's like at her grandma's house. Uh -uh. It's a cartoon. Uh -uh. Well, there's a lot. Is this currently popular? Or is this something from the nineties? It's currently popular, I believe. Okay. I've never seen it on TV. Nano Land. Nana Land. Nana, like like a grandmother. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, I think the premise I think is this kid's at her grandma's house, is the premise of the show. But there's a lot of TikToks where people are like, when like you go to say hi to your boyfriend after having like an anger outburst or something and it's a clip from that show hide your boyfriend when you go to see your boyfriend uh, or say hi to your boyfriend uh, okay after having like an angry outburst or it's like when you are like getting period cramps and you know and it's comparing these like life things to clips from this show but we've been finding it so freaking funny mm. so a lot of my algorithm are just like nano land clips <laughs> Is this also in your Instagram Explorer? Uh, that one is just like a smorgasbord of different things. Okay. There's no consistency. Yeah. But back to the point, baby otters. They need to be in more places because they're very cute. And I think if like, like what if we had like a mailman, but instead of a mailman, it was a baby otter man. And he just like went around with a baby otter and like knocked on your door every day. And if you wanted to, you could give it a cuddle yeah. and then you'd go to the next place. That's, um, that's, I would vote for that. Uh, yeah, I think that would bring a lot more joy to people's <clears throat> lives. I've recently turned on, have you heard of Sea Wolves? <laughs> have it, like, is it a show or yeah, just an it's, animal? It's a, it's a show on Netflix, no, that, like I've a series. It, it uh, actually is following Vancouver Island oh. and like all the wildlife that is out there. And sea wolves are apparently wolves out there that swim in the ocean. Um, but one of the clips from the first couple of episodes, I'm only able to half tune in because when I wake up early with the kids, I try to throw on something not like melting their brain in the background and something that's going to entertain me. Uh, but the otters just, you probably know this as an otter fan, but they just float on their back with a rock on their belly and just grab oysters and crush oysters on the rock and munch on oysters. What a good life. That's a great life. Fucking oysters have got it figured, or otters have got it figured out. I also think, like, we used to have class pets in school, yeah. mainly preschool, where they'd Usually have, like, a hamsters, cute right? bunny or yeah. something. I just think, like, office places, even the grocery store, like, there should be a class pet of all these places, and it should be a baby otter. Mm. And imagine, like, you're going through the produce aisle, you're about to get to the cereals, and you just see, like, a cute otter. That just, it's just there to make your day better. Yeah. Saying hamster makes me remember that I had a pet hamster when I was a kid, Ew. and we also had a cat. Oh, I could. And then I didn't have a hamster. <laughs> win win. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. not a hamster gerbil person. Um, I will tell this story. My mom would probably deny it. It was fact. This is a fact. This is 100% factual. My dad's gonna be listening. I actually don't know if he knows about this. That's how short lived it was. When my brother first went to college, he's older. My mom got like a hamster gerbil, whatever, from the freaking pet store. Yeah. Put it in Charlie's room and named it Charlie. <laughs> and this was like a two day thing. Like she was excited about it. And I I don't like hamster gerbils. The hamster existed for two days or what? I think she brought it back because I, uh, I don't think I was very for it. Yeah. Um, I think she ended up realizing like what goes into taking care of one of these animals. Yeah. 
and brought it back but i remember distinctly and like it was so fleeting that i sometimes think this was like a fever dream i know it wasn't it was so fleeting but it was on i, I know the piece of furniture next to his bed that she cleared off and she put it on there and she named him charlie and i was like you are batshit insane yeah. like this can't happen <laughs> I have to imagine it's very tough to lose your kids to college. Jen and I are already grappling with that. Like as much shit as I give about being uh, parents of young kids, like we are already sad about the idea that one day they will be gone. And I, I could imagine replacing them with the same named pets from a pet store. I am. Um, I'm a psychopath. This isn't the other day like this week, but like in the past several weeks, I don't know what mood I was in. I was probably PMSing, but there was a point where I said to Garrett, like, what are we going to do when the kids go to college? And he was like, <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> he was yeah. like, this is not something we need to worry about yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's younger. That's tough. That's a tough pill for him to swallow. Well, like also we're not engaged. We're not married. Sure. We don't have kids. Oh. So from my crazy brain to be like, what are we going to do? <laughs> like, shut up. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> My first uh, campaign promise is, I give you guys this example in the thread, that uh, when you're going through TSA at the airport, we're done with the taking off the shoes or removing the laptop from your backpack. It, there was one person that tried to explode a plane with their shoes, and apparently for the rest of the time, we're just gonna be taking our shoes off at the airport. It seems like a stupid thing. Like, I don't imagine that many people are trying to sneak bombs in through their shoes nowadays. And also they have those scanners that can like, tell you the exact size of your penis like i have a feeling they can probably discern if you've got any sort of serious explosive happening in your shoe the airports have a scanner that'll tell you the size of your penis i think they had to change out of it because be for that exact reason like no it, yeah like it would show up an image it was like a scan and like no. you could see people's little tiny dicks talk tucked off to the side shut up yeah that must I, that must have been such a fun time being a TSA agent. Just seeing nothing but dicks all day long. Yeah, like does the does your mental image of what it is match what it ends up being? Sure, I'm sure that was a very fun game to, be, oh. to make guesses and then actually get the result. Listeners of Backpack Radio, if you have ever worked at TSA during this time, please podcast at the Trek Co. Yeah. Tell us your experience. Yeah. Um, I thought you were just being funny. No, it's a that real is thing. Incredible. I think they have the technology that's used now is slightly different. Maybe the dick images goes to like a back computer or something like that. But I'm pretty sure that people aren't sneaking bombs through their shoes. Wow. So yeah, yeah. We're, get, okay. we're getting rid of that. We're getting rid of that. Okay. Um, and my second one, I have a long list here, is... <clears throat> Starting at the age of 70, every five years, people have to take a driving test. Yeah, I like that. Um, I saw an article the other day that was like, what do you think about this? And it was literally people over 70. Um, but I would say more, more often than not, the times I come here with road rage is because of someone old. On my way home from the gym yesterday, the speed limit was 40 and I got stuck on a two lane road behind somebody going 10 miles per hour in a non-passing area. It's, it's just like, I, there's a difference between being safe and just being like, you probably don't belong on the road anymore. It's like conflicting because my dad is 70 now. Both my parents and are I'm 70. Like, and I think they would pass this test yeah, with flying this colors. This guy is totally sane and yeah. also would probably not love being told he had to do this. Um, but at the same time, like when my grandma was driving and like starting to get signs of dementia, she was following us home from something one time and like the car just stopped being behind us. And this is like pre cell phones. So we got back to her place and we were like, we'll just, I guess, wait a bit and see if she shows up. She didn't. So then we started calling people's house phones. Turns out while she was driving, she forgot where she was going. So she went to, I think, her sister's house. Um, and it took until we called them for us to find out where she was. That isn't good. This happened a few years ago, but on a four lane road, we're at a stoplight, red light, and the car next to me comes to the red light, stops, and then just goes, treats it like a stop sign. Uh -oh. <laughs> and then I eventually caught up with this person. And of course they were old as can be. Um, you know, maybe that could happen to anybody, but I think I think driving tests, I think keeping the roads safe is probably just a good idea. I would be open to this, like, because I, I can understand people of that age group that are mentally sound and physically able to not love this take and to kind of feel it's very ageist. by it. I admit, very ageist. I would be I would be fine with us doing this test for everyone. 
at sure. incremental periods. Yeah. Like, but- so that they're not feeling, like, targeted. I mean, there's plenty of people that suck at driving our age. Yeah. Listen to my rants about roundabouts. I will say my parallel parking game has gone down significantly going from a Honda Civic to a truck. But if you had a driving test every however years... I would brush up on it You'd be a great parallel parker, probably, or you wouldn't be driving. Yeah. And that would be a major inconvenience to you. But, uh, yeah, we need to make sure that people on the road are sound, of sound mind. Cool. Um, Which one do I want to do next? I'm going to go with, this one's like a, it's a, it's a bundle, um, mandatory PTO. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of places are like doing unlimited PTO as like a perk. You end up taking less. Everyone knows that because then you feel guilted. Not I like, always. If you're, if you're giving me unlimited PTO, I would actually rather you give me set PTO because I don't want to feel guilty for being like I'm taking two weeks off. When I was managing, I had unlimited PTO, and it was like I felt guilty when I took one week because I had to find someone to cover my team, like do all this stuff, whatever. And as my position now where I have like hourly accrued PTO, I don't care. Like I'm about to leave for a week, and I could care less because it's like I have this time. You can see the number there. I'm using what I've earned. makes you feel less guilty. Um, But Garrett's job does mandatory PTO, which mm. I think is great because one of his, one of our mutual friends, like, was gonna get in trouble because she hadn't taken her five days off that quarter yet, and I think there's such like a rat race environment where a lot of people won't take the time off, and then like they look good and overachieving and like actually are burning out and not like recouping, and then other people feel pressured to not take as much. I like the idea of you have to take it so that you don't feel guilty doing it. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good philosophy. But I'm I'm also bundling this, so I think that summer vacation shouldn't end after school, and that <laughs> there should still be a winter break. Yeah. And I think the Europeans get away with it, and they find a way to make it happen without their economy shutting down. Um, and I just think we need that time. Like I think going so long without these breaks is just like very defeating. Yeah, uh, I will say we do we don't have a strict PTO policies. If you're working for me full time, you can just take time off. And I would say the three people now that we've had working full time are very good at it. And as long as it's not overlapping with when I'm gone, which nowadays happens never, uh, they always do a very good job of taking advantage of that. But you're also not corporate America. No, and because it's a long distance backpacking media company, right. that's usually what the time is spent on. So even when they're taking time off, they're still kind of working, which in the best way possible. But uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Jenna worked for a nonprofit prior to getting into real estate, and she definitely, I, she witnessed what you're saying that a lot of people didn't take advantage of the unlimited PTO, but she definitely did. So I mean, we're we're approaching. I know this is getting released January 29th, but at this actual time that we're recording, we are approaching the end of the year. And even in our team chat at work, a lot of people have been asking how much rolls over. And they've got way more hours than what rolls over, and they're just going to have to get cashed out on it. Yeah. And it's like, how burnt out are you? You know, Mm -hmm. even if you say you're not, you know, it's you're not using any of this time and you're at work so many consistent days and weeks and months without a break. Like, when do you when do you focus on you stuff? You know, and I think for a lot of people, then they don't have them stuff and they don't have outside hobbies they pursue. And it's just like none of that can be good. Yeah. From my perspective, I like the unlimited PTO because I don't want to have to mandate like a specific day is taken off. And uh, I and I'm always very upfront about the fact when I'm just going to fuck off in the middle of the week to encourage them to follow suit. Like uh, two weeks ago, it was just randomly 60 degrees in the middle of the week. And I texted Owen. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to make our call because I'm going golfing. So like to him, I'm telling him, like, anytime you want to go do something like that, please do, because uh, Ultimately, it behooves the business owner, too, because if you're happier in your work, you're more likely to, do, one, do a good job, and two, stick around. Like it's Yeah, it's, it's a different environment. Yeah, yeah. We, we are definitely an odd bunch. Oh, my second one. Right, that was okay. That was two, so I have my third. Oh, which one will I pick, and which one will I go to honorable mentions? It's so hard to rank these. 
Okay. Mm. Pick numbers one or two. Two. Okay. No blackouts for football. Um, yeah. AKA when you're in a certain area. Or professional sports in general. Sure, fine. We'll open it up to the masses. Well, for football, which is the one that I know, when you're in a certain area and that area's team is playing, they will black out other games. And I always had this issue growing up because I grew up in downstate New York, obviously a Bills fan. Um, but whenever the Giants or the Jets were playing, everything blacked out the Bills. Like you couldn't see it because you had to watch the Giants or the Jets. Out here for the past couple of weeks, fuck, even the even the Kansas City Bills game, that's a huge game, blacked out because the Bill, the Broncos mm-hmm. are playing. Who gives a fuck about the Broncos? Yeah. Um, I'm probably angering people there. But so we've been streaming like through the Xbox on these like pirate sites, illegal streams of these games that keep freezing in the middle because the streams are getting disconnected. And it's like, just let me watch the team I want to watch. This was the first year that I've gotten Sunday ticket, mostly because this is the first year where it is not tied to direct TV. So you can just pay for it by itself. And it's been a blessing. I only care about Bears games. And yeah, if it's ever competing with a Broncos game, it, it'll never be played. And they're bad. So. so Sunday ticket doesn't block them out? No. I'm going to be texting the, you for your password. Yeah, the only thing that you don't get on Sunday ticket are the games that are nationally televised, which you can get if you've got whatever anyways. Well, we've got Red Zone. And I can get behind Red Zone because I like that you get to see so much at once when the games are overlapping and you can't watch all of them. But I also don't like that it just shows you the red zone because I feel like when you get into the game, like part of getting into it is like the tension between the red zones. And so when you're only seeing, we're in the red zone, we're in the red zone, we're in the red zone, it almost becomes like basketball where it's moving so fast, you can't really like get into it. Yeah, no, you wanna see the foreplay leading up to the- Yeah, tease me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Football. Yeah, uh, the worst version of blackout games. This isn't this is what I thought you meant? Was I am not a Blackhawks fan simply because when I was a kid growing up, the Blackhawks blacked out every single home game. You couldn't watch it on TV because they that was their way of encouraging you to go to the game. Is that Chicago? I, they've gotten rid of it. So the I thought when, they were in. I thought they were out here. The Blackhawks. Yeah, no, that's the Avalanche. No, I know that. Oh. I just, well. Yeah, it's the Chicago Blackhawks. What's the name of that casino on the way to the mountain? Oh, that's Black Hawk, the town okay, of Black Okay, so I always think the Black Hawks are out there. Yeah, yeah. No, and that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, Chica- but that's what my brain thinks. Chicago's hockey team is the Black Hawks. And when I grew up, the, the owner's son came into power after the owner died and got rid of this immediately. But all of the home games were unavailable to watch on local TV because the owner wanted to encourage people to go to the game. Yeah, so that's wild. It's it, like legitimately, I don't care about hockey for that specific reason. Wow. Yeah. Um, my second thing is, <clears throat> this is a little bit of a wild one, so hold on to your butts here. But I think that the head of the FDA or the heads, whoever are the decision makers, must eat one meal <laughs> per day decided by a giant spinning wheel, which includes all of the foods or ingredients or anything like that that are not allowed in European countries. So there's a lot of things that our FDA allows that whatever the European version of that. Skittles. Uh, I'm sure Skittles are fine. Maybe, maybe no, they Skittles use, are on that list. Oh, are they really? In, I don't think they're allowed in Europe anymore. Okay. But the moral of the story here is I want the person that is making the decisions that these foods are allowed to be eating these foods too. Because if you are saying that you can eat blue... 7BG and all these things made by Monsanto. These are perfectly healthy for the population to consume, but you're going home and eating food that's grown in your yard exclusively. It says to me that you're probably not, uh, <clears throat> you're not engaging in the things that you think are safe for other people. So I, w- I, I would make this a mandatory thing that the populace gets to decide what the heads of the FDA eat and it has to be within their um, allowed food list. Um, titanium dioxide, the chemical found in Skittles, is also banned in several other places, including the EU. However, the FDA has said the chemical can be safely consumed in small quantities. They just found out something with like the Simply Orange, like those juices, where they have, what are the, the forever somethings? Forever chemicals? Yeah. They know. apparently have those in them, where it's like it stays in your system forever. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I think they should, well, they should have to, I'll amend yours, they should have to eat these things in excess for a set period before it becomes approved. And continue like, to Put after, your money where your mouth is. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't, I suspect that there are favors being paid when they make these decisions. So I want it to be that they have to live with the consequences of these decisions. I saw one the other day that was saying, oh, I sent it to Garrett last night. It was a Instagram video from a nature account that was saying that pink Himalayan salt is not good to eat because you like a lot of it comes apparently out of China and apparently has high quantities of mercury mm. in it. Um, so that was surprising because that's what we have in the house. But it was saying that you have to eat Celtic salt, which I've never heard of. Hmm. But yeah, shit like that. Yeah. I, I just want the people that are making the decisions to also participate in it because uh, I have a, sne a sneaking suspicion that they don't. And my last one here is uh, sort of in line with what you're saying is I think that there should be at least one mandatory holiday per year where people are encouraged, maybe required to go outside. And specifically, this will be stratified per zip code. So not everyone gets the same day off. So like REI does this opt outside thing on Black Friday, which I think is awesome. I think it's a really good idea. But the result of encouraging everyone to go outside is that the trails are just overflowing with people. I think there's got to be some sort of system where uh, based on region, you're allowing the holidays to exist at different dates so the trails aren't overrun. And in this system, as president, I think that it would just be randomly assigned by zip code. So um, it would show no favoritism for wealthier zip codes. You would pick all the zip codes that exist. I think it's like 4,500 zip codes in the U.S. And they would be assigned throughout the year based on your zip code. Hell yeah. Yeah. Honorable mentions? Uh, I know you'll agree with this one because we've talked about it quite a bit. But um, I just want at the end of the year for the IRS to send me a bill for yeah. what I owe in taxes. Fucking tell me how much. Instead of spending in arm and a leg paying a CPA to like run all these tricks and do all these things and fuck with all the numbers so much like it just creates so much stress and it's so incredibly unnecessary just like you guys know how much money I owe you because if I don't pay you the right amount you throw me in jail like this is there's no secrets here just tell me what I owe you let's get rid of the whole tax accountant thing and move on with our lives also use email the fact that like I can call you and be like, hey, why is this stuff like not done the way it should be? And your answer is, we sent you a letter. And I say, I never got it. And you say, oh, well, we sent it. There's no accountability there. Yeah. Send me a freaking email. Yeah. We are in 2024 now. And the fact that you are still relying on paper mail and being like, we hope it gets to you, lick the stamp, send it off, toss me an email. You know, like I'll see it quicker put a link on there that I could click to go pay you and stop saying that you can't do email. Stop it. Stop saying that because the fact that I have to deal with them say the, the fact that on my lowest paid year, I know I've bitched about this before. You are saying that you don't like they, they didn't file my tax return for 2019 because they weren't sure it was me. Why would you not be sure it was me? I did it through like one of those online things and there was no income. Why would anyone lie about this, <laughs> right? Like, I'm yeah. not lying about, like, having no money. <clears throat> um, but, like, send me an email, you know? Like, hey, I never got this letter that you apparently sent that said all this. Send me an email. Be like, hey, was this you? Yeah. The, the whole tax thing is such a scam. And the financial industry lobbies hard to keep themselves in business and grow their jobs to make it as confusing as possible. Yeah, they probably make a lot of money on the interest. They definitely do. What about you? I specifically left finances off of this list because I knew I'd get it. <laughs> um, siestas. We yeah. should have siestas. Nap time, middle of the day, every day. Are you Siesta. a good napper? I'm a great napper. I nap really good. Mm. Uh, I love I love a nap. Um, other one, I saw an article online the other day, and I actually found it when I was looking at this. Um, I'm trying to hold in a sneeze. <coughs> okay, got it. Bless you. This article that came across my feed said, Colorado High School, it's a Denver 7 article. 
Colorado High School offers classes that teaches home ownership skills like plumbing, electricity, and more. Uh, and I know that they used to have home ec, like where you could like sew a teddy bear and stuff. But I think that like this is a very valuable class and I would have loved to have it. And I think that schools, when people are growing up, should have this stuff. Because when I grew up, it was all like stay away from trades. If you go into construction, you're going to break your back mm -hmm. and you won't be able to work anymore because yeah. you'll have burnt yourself out. Yeah. And it actually is a like a very. Yeah. Now you got a bunch of guys go who like dropped out of high school who are making like tons of money, $200,000 a year. Yeah. I think I think high school is teaching trade skills like that and also i think high school is teaching like an intro to like business you know like how to approach the idea of working for yourself yeah um would be highly valuable yeah more so than calculus like i, d I couldn't tell you one thing about calculus and i did okay in math but yeah having more life skills that were applicable being taught in lower levels of education personal finance are things that would actually benefit teaching people how to meditate are you kidding me yeah like, i didn't need to know about sine and cosine and no. you know that never derivatives has like, come up no i'm not going to be a computer you can engineer. elect into them like let's say i really want to be a physicist sure maybe i'll take some of these classes yeah but if i don't yeah uh, my last honorable mention here is I could have a few more, but I might save some of these is as president, I would earmark a shit ton of money, hundreds of billions, probably to just building up more trails all over the place. Mm. And Topical. it seems this is a very <laughs> uh, local complaint, but I can't believe that there's not a trail that goes from Golden to Boulder. Yeah, That's there should a, be a triangle. Yeah. And it, with my five hundred million billion dollar package that would be built in a couple of months, and I'd also hire a lot of people to go out and patrol and make sure that people weren't using Bluetooth out on or uh, the Bluetooth speakers out on trail. Mm. And if you do, controversial, yeah, if you do have a Bluetooth speaker on trail, you go to prison for life. That's extreme, <laughs> but okay. Um, my last one is my most controversial. Yeah, I think. Have More than going to prison for life for using a Bluetooth speaker? Probably for the listener. Okay. Um, I think this one will probably rile more people up. But you know, you've know, you seen The Hunger Games, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say we should do that. But televised, basically the premise of televised stuff like that's happening that everyone like can watch. Like the Olympics? I think, no. I think this should be something that happens during campaign season for like elections for presidents instead of them just standing on a stage talking over each other and trying to like strut their feathers bigger i think there should be a series of things that is televised fully like live not so, so they can't edit any of it and people get to watch to help them like decide who they want to vote for but it should be things like a world history test mm. a u.s history test a psyche vow um like emotional intelligence test um, putting them under a period of high stress and seeing what they do and how they react. Yeah. I think this would be a very entertaining show. Sure. And I think you'll get more out of that than watching them talk about like why they're better than someone else on a stage. Yeah. Like I want to see how you act under pressure and I want to see how much of the world you actually know about. Sure. And they never even answer the questions anyways. They just exactly. spin it to their talking points. And like, it's always something that everybody agrees with. Like, yeah, let's get rid of poverty. Like, yeah, everyone thinks you should get rid of poverty. And it can be like alone. Like, I don't need these guys in an arena together doing this shit because then they're going to be focused more on like beating other people. Yeah. I want to see you on your own. Though the competition could be like Squid Game style. It would be pretty funny. <laughs> well, I think like getting a Caesar Flickerman, like the guy that, you know, yeah. MCs the Hunger Games, mm -hmm. getting someone like that to take us like now we're looking over at camera two where we're watching so and so sure. fill out his world history test yeah he thought you know like a great bread British was the capital baking of... show but for their mental psyche yeah and knowledge because like i want to see the stuff that they don't want to tell me yeah i want to see how little you know about certain things or how much you know yeah i want to see like what your reactions are under situations that you weren't expected to face yeah and i think that the entertainment it could give me as well as the um, tools to make the decision that I want to make better would just be all around a win. I like that. That sounds like prime entertainment. Yeah. And you actually get to learn a little bit more about the candidates, yeah. including us, because we're going to be future presidents. I don't want to be one. Yeah. Um, do I have any more that I want to share? The other one I was going to say was just 
mandatory four day work weeks, but that's kind of in line with. I was going to put that. Yeah. I felt like my package yeah. summed Just it up. Just less time working, better work yeah. balance, I think, is a good thing for everybody. Okay. Uh, that's it. Let us know what your campaign promises would be, the things that you would run for president on, because uh, we definitely want to know. Mailbag. Mailbag. All right. Message. My poop story. One day, on a short backpacking trip, I found myself waking up one morning with the sudden urge that it was time to maybe get up and go to the bathroom. I ran as I got up. The urge grew more and more, so as I approached the outhouses, they were under construction and found a toilet mounted high above the ground with no walls open to the air, and I raced to the top, climbed up on, and released my demons. I learned that in my haste of leaving camp, I was unable to find my toilet paper and only able to grab my brand new pack towel with no other choice. I attempted to tear a towel unsuccessfully, leaving only the option of using all four corners individually one at a time and then dropping the towel into the toilet less than I always keep up your supplies. Where am I reading bad here? Uh, individually one at a time and then dropping the towel in the toilet less than I always keep your supplies at hand. No, you read that correctly. Oh, lesson that uh. I always keep. Lesson to always keep your supplies on hand and not buried in your pack. That might have been a voice to text thing where l lesson got turned into less than. I would, I love an idea of someone in the midst of being so busy that they have to voice to text, <laughs> voice to <laughs> texting story. a shit story to yeah. us via email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of is fun. Yeah. Uh, that is from Steve from Victoria in British Columbia. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, we should mention that it's probably a lot, not the most leave no trace option because I don't think those pack towels break down too well in the pit yeah. toilets. But uh, yeah, desperate times, desperate measures. I guess in that scenario, if you didn't have your TP, uh, you would have to do like a weird waddle and like dig up pine cones and leaves and all the other uncomfortable stuff to put in your butthole. Well, you could also wipe your ass with your pack towel, but then bring it back with you. Yeah, that's another option. Put it in your I'm a big bag. fan of not carrying my shit out. So I, as much as I hate sticking pine cones in my ass, and I do, I would probably go that route huh. as opposed to carrying my shit. Have you wiped your ass with a pine cone? No. The only time, I think I've said this on the podcast, where I got caught in that predicament was on a day hike. I went to uh, Argentine Pass, which is just on the south side, I think, of uh, Grays and Tories approach from Keystone up like a rugged gravel road in my civic terrible decision and like n almost never on day hikes I should say up up until that point never on day hikes do I get the urge to shit and it just hit me like a like a it was something that was so undeniable it had to happen within 30 seconds fortunately um it was still early enough in the season that there was a patch of snow on the north side face of the mountain. So I went to shit just below the snow patch, dug the hole <clears throat> and wiped with snow. And it was a magical experience. It, wiping with snow, I will stand by this, is better than wiping with toilet paper, better than a bidet. I've never used a bidet, but I can imagine that a bidet feels as good as snow. Uh, it made me want to use snow more often as toilet paper. So I got very lucky in that circumstance. If it would have been dry, I would have been using rocks and dirt and a, hope like a dead squirrel. I don't know what I would have resorted to, but it wouldn't have been pretty. Yeah, I, I want to try snow. I've heard good things about it's, it. It's so nice, especially like that north facing summer snow is hard. So it's not like the snow that you'll get in the winter where it's fluffy and like decompose or uh, disintegrate while you're wiping. like. But it, the hard snow is kind of like sharp. It is a little bit sharper. It's a little bit, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a firmer feel on the whole. <laughs> but uh, the plus side there is it's not gonna break. You don't have to worry about it like disintegrating as you're wiping and getting your hand full of shit. It, it will, it'll hold its form very nicely. Yeah, that would be a surprise. Yeah, so. Just a le little learning lesson for Steve and all of our listeners about the proper way to wipe in an emergency situation. Situation. To the five-star review portion of today's show, this podcast saved my life. This is from Bruno Esk. 
It occurred to me that I owed you guys a five-star review for possibly saving my life this past summer. I live in Northern Kentucky near Cincinnati, Ohio, but had been up to Maine for vacation. I came back from Maine and started to feel what I thought was COVID-19, but oddly nothing respiratory and negative rapid tests. I went to urgent care and they were stumped too. When I got back from urgent care, it occurred to me that they had asked if I had been around anyone infectious, but didn't ask me if I had been anywhere. That is when podcast episode number 200 about Lyme came back to me. I'd been regularly checking myself for ticks, but must have missed one. I found that bullseye rash and made an appointment to see the doc the next morning. When I told her I thought I had Lyme and I was suspicious based upon a backpacking podcast and the two guests, one an expert on ticks and the other a doctor specializing in infectious disease, I then showed her the bullseye rash. She was so excited she took pictures because they never see Lyme in this area. Chauncey Badger, keep up the good work and maybe I'll... T- I'll next you my best pooping in the woods story. I'll next tell you. I'll next tell you my best pooping in the woods story. That's from Kevin Bruno Burns. I love hearing that. Yeah, that is, that's the goal of when we do those episodes, isn't it? And I should specify, I don't love hearing that you got Lyme. Right, that is not. Yeah, I, I love that we are sharing information that allowed you to properly diagnose that. Yeah, cause I mean, those are always episodes where it's kind of like, I hope people are interested in this. Like if you go too far down the sciencey aspect, sometimes it can get a little dull. Um, but I think like the idea that it planted that info in the back of someone's mind and they were able to go and help themselves with it yeah. is kind of what we want. Yeah. I take for granted that the bullseye rash is just like a uniformly universal known thing, but uh, that is born on the fact that I'm paranoid about Lyme disease. So. Um, that's something that we should probably rehash on at least an annual basis because, yeah, if you spend too much time in the woods, Lyme disease is a very real risk. Probably the most serious thing that you'll encounter here in the U.S. Uh, just based on how common it is. Yeah. So thank you, Kevin, for sharing your story. And I'm hoping somebody listening to this also uh, ups their awareness of the seriousness of Lyme disease. Sticker code. Tell us what your presidential campaign platform would be based on. Yep perfect easy thank you to our chuck norris award winners on patreon that is alex and misty with navigators crafting andrew austin mcdaniel austin ford brad and blair from 13 adventures brent stenberg brian alsop fables christopher marshburn coach for marion outdoors dane ish Derek cook eric casper the friendly eric, ghost eric hoffman greg knight greg mcdaniel iron hike endurance productions liz sigur matt sukup mike poisel patrick cianciallo sawyer products spam timothy hahn solo and tracy trigger thanks is your voice ever heard after those? No, but I get really upset with myself when I don't get a good one. Yeah. Like that was a good, that one. Was a good one. The last episode was like not yeah. well executed. I think about it afterwards. You should. Thank you. Subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you can consume podcasts. Follow us on at Backpacker Radio on Instagram and TikTok, at Backpacker Pod on X, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. You can follow Chance. You can find me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Chauncey. And you can get my book, Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon. I think our package is done. So you have to buy our books individually now. Sorry about it. My books are Appalachian Trials and Pacific Crest Trials. Uh, yet again, please follow us and subscribe on YouTube. We've got this beautiful background just for you guys to be able to visually enjoy the podcast. And that is it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening and happy hiking. Bye.